In the book of Ephesians tonight, very briefly, I just want to talk to you for a few moments about enjoying the riches you have in Christ. I want us to stand together and begin in verse 3 and read down through uh, verse, I don't know, I may read till I get tired. Let's stand together, please, as we read together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all, circle the word all, spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Circle the word in, it's found over and over again in the book of Ephesians and also in the book of Colossians. In Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Not only have we been birthed into the family of God, we've been adopted in the family of God. And there is a difference in the Bible, those two words. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through the blood, and all God's people said, for the forgiveness of sins, and all God's people said, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in him, in whom ye also trusted, that ye heard, after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Amen. which is the earnest of the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Father, we can continue to read and all of it's good. We hear about the riches we have in Christ Jesus and sometimes we don't enjoy those riches. Lord, riches now, riches in the ages to come because we're heirs and joint heirs of God and Lord, we're in the family. And Father, you've already told us in the Bible that we are saved and justified and set apart for your use and Lord, you've given us a lot of blessings. We've been blessed to thee. I think, Lord, sometimes we need you to stop and just have a blessing service. We've been blessed. And Lord, how grateful we ought to be tonight for all that we have in Christ Jesus. For just a few moments, Lord, may we just share a thought or two before we spend some time in praying and going to the house. May your will be accomplished, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. You know, the Lord only has to say something one time to make it so. It's amazing to me how he uses little words over and over again to remind us all, 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 all. All means all, and that's all all can mean. And they use that little preposition in over and over and over again. So easy it is to forget who you are. We are children of the Most High God. I've been birthed into the family, John 3, Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. He didn't say it over and over again. John 3 is the only place basically outside of Peter you find that born again phrase. 
You don't have to say it over and over again. You got to be born again, born again. He said it one time. God meant what he said and said what he meant. And somebody says when he uses the word must in front of something, you better lift up your ears, take note. It means something great and eternal. You must be born again. So I was birthed into the family of God many years ago. I'm grateful as a child that I was birthed into the family of God, baptized by the Holy Ghost of God into the family of God. And I am a partaker of the divine Holy Spirit. But I not only have been birthed in the family of God, I have been adopted in the family of God. That means he placed in me the privilege and the glory of his glory and my glory to be able to glorify him with what he gives me and that I have been adopted in the family that I have access to everything that Jesus has access to. The Bible says I am an heir of God and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when you're a joint heir with somebody, that means you share together, right? That means you get a share in the blessings. And nobody has been blessed more than uh, the Lord Jesus to our own life by coming to this world and paying a price and dying. So I'm glad tonight to the praise and the honor and glory of God, I've been birthed in the family of God. So if you're glad you're saved tonight, birthed in the family of God, name written down in glory, would you echo with saying amen? amen. Isn't it great to be saved? Then I've been adopted into the family. I mean son placed. I've been positioned and placed in the family and God has given me the riches of his blessings. Now sometimes we don't understand it and I know I don't understand it completely but I get down to verse 18. Paul said I want the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. Stop there. Dwell there for a while. I want your eyes to be open as recorded already in Sunday school this morning about the event in Elisha's day when he prayed for the servant's eyes to be open to see what he would see. The Apostle Paul says, I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. Now the Holy Ghost of God is to be our enlightener. The Holy Ghost of God is to be the one that puts the illumination of his light on us. He said, I will teach you all things you need to know. Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost will come, he shall be a teacher. He shall be your comforter. He shall be the convictor. He shall help you. He will enlighten you more and more if you allow him to, that you may know. That you may know what? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward? who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, which he raised him up from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now, tonight, much praise ought to be given as Paul got carried away almost some things, some, some say, I know it was by divine inspiration, but he gave a sentence that went on and on and on and on and to the praise of his glory three times, under the praise of his glory, under the praise of his glory. It's almost like a shindo going upwards and getting louder, under the praise and the glory of the Lord, under the praise and the glory of the Lord, under the praise and the glory of the Lord. And he said, it's yours to enjoy the praise and the glory of God and the riches that he's given, given to us who are his children. Amen. And I've been blessed to be in the Pauly family. I have their name. They named me James Marvin Pauly. I am a Pauly. When I got saved, I became a Christian. I am James Marvin the saint. That's what the Bible says. He called us saints of God in verse 1. So I am a saint. That means I've been sanctified, set apart for the master's use. Oh, how we need to learn and continue. The Bible says to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. What's it mean to study the Word of God? Well, you, you can hear the Word of God. How many of you right now, as far as you can ascertain, you're hearing what I'm saying? So you have ears to hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's little finger on the hand. Remember the little analogy? And then you can read the Word of God. If you're able to read it all, and some may be slower than others, but all of us can read the Word of God from time to time. Have you read any other scriptures this week? besides what you've read today in church? 
Have you spent some time just reading the Word of God, not for any other reason except for the illumination and the enlightenment of your soul? Lord, speak to me. And when we get bound to pray and we talk to God the Father, we've been reading the book, and the Word of God is Him speaking to us, and prayer is us speaking to Him. Father, would you speak to me today? Have you ever just got down with God and began to talk, Lord, I need something from you today. Would you speak to me? Now, He doesn't always speak, and He doesn't speak with a loud voice. I've never heard an audible voice of God. Now, if you've heard that, God bless you. I've never heard God's voice audibly, but I've heard Him. There is ears on the inside of a man's soul that is tuned toward heaven. Down deep in the spirit of man dwells the spirit of God. And we can have access to be able to talk to the God of heaven. And sometimes he's just able to give us something that we need for that day. And if for not that day, it may be the next day. And I found in my own life, as I've read scriptures, and you've read scriptures, that sometimes just a verse jumps out at us. And having that word, I started this past month, in the month of May, a new word every day. A new word every day. And so I write the word down on the left-hand column, find a reference that went with that, that came to my mind, and I put down words and just dwell on that word for a day. You can have a word for a day, a verse for a day, or a chapter a day. Uh, you can have a book for a day. You can have the whole Bible for a day. And you'll never exhaust the riches of God's word. Right. We'll never grasp it completely. Somebody says, we sing the song, by and by, when we get to heaven, we'll understand it better by and by. I don't think so. I don't think we'll ever understand it. I think we'll understand some better, and don't take me wrong. I think there's some things we'll say, boy, I didn't know that was going on. I didn't know that happened like that. My, that's amazing how God worked that out. But we'll be learning throughout eternity. He is God, and we're not. And we will learn as His children not to be obedient to the law, but to rejoice in the grace of God. There'd be no law in heaven. It's there, all grace. Somebody says, preacher, will God have to make you live right? No, you're going to live right because you're there. And you've been adopted in the family of God and you want to enjoy God's blessing. And I don't think you'll have a choice to chide down the road and decide I don't want to be here long longer. I think one glimpse of his dear face will erase all the cares and the problems and the wrinkles and the trials of your life. One dear look on the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and many things will just be erased and say, well, glory to God, praise the Lord, as Paul was echoing here, to praise and glory to the Lord above. And I think all of us sometimes forget how much we can enjoy it, but studying. Well, you can hear the Word of God, you can read the Word of God, but that middle finger, the longest protruding finger you have, somebody says, means to study the Word of God. Because when you study the Word of God, you're taking a Bible, sometime with a pencil in your hand, sometime with a commentary beside it, or maybe a dictionary. Uh, Brother P.J. Parker, I was talking to this morning, he sort of quoted what Lester Roloff said. He says, I come to place in my life, all my books and my library, i just about ready to pack them up. And Lester Roloff said, I heard him say it at Northside Baptist years ago, he'd been preaching oh, many, many years. He said, well, I got rid of all my books. Boy, that'd be a terrible thing for me to have to say I'm going to do, but I may do it one day. I'm going to have to do it one of these days. He said, I got rid of all my books. I don't have anything except a King James Bible and a Strong's Concordance. And he said, if I knew my Bible like I should, I wouldn't need the strong concordance. And he said, that's what I want to live and die by. And if you ever heard Lester Olaf preach what he read that morning, if he was in a conference, he preached to you that night. That's where he got his sermon. He'd read a passage. He'd say, that's good, that's good, that's good. And come back and tell the folks what he read that morning in his devotion time. Oftentimes, just preaching sermons that come to him and study. But studying is really amplifying. Let the, let the light shine a little deeper. Let it take a little longer. You can't spend hours and hours sometimes studying the Bible. You don't have that time. Trying to work, trying to do the things you need to do, and that's all part of living. But you can study sometimes a little longer than you maybe think you can. You can take a, a ball game and last a couple hours. I've tried to pick up the Dodgers this year. I've not watched them play a game yet. But I've sat and watched a Dodger game for two hours and a half or three hours. Or four if it went into overtime. You say, well, that's pleasure. Are you listening to me? 
But we who have been adopted in the family of God, enjoying the riches of Jesus Christ, can't spend two hours sometime just reading the Bible and studying it. We often say, and most of us have said it, that I don't have time to read the Bible. We have time to do basically what we want to do and where the priority is in your life. I'm not saying take it away from things that are priority in your life, but it needs to be in your life. Somebody says it needs to be at the top of the list, spending time with God. And then the rest of the list ought to fall into place. And you can determine how much time you're going to use. Some days you can do longer. Some days it may be shorter. Some days it may be in the car. Some days it may be while you're working. Some days it may be this here and there while you pick up a verse or read or pray a little bit. But there ought to be some time where you can just sit down and meditate with God and study intently the Word of God and at least understand it a little better that you may be enlightened that you may know. Know what? Know, in verse 18, what is the hope of His calling? If my hope is in Jesus Christ, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. His hope is an anchor to our soul. And we can believe it in trying days when the waters are restless and the waves are boisterous and the, and the, and the ship is being pushed forward and sideways and up and down upon the seas of life. Somewhere along the way, the Lord Jesus comes to the bow of the ship, stands up and raises his hand, the nail-scarred hand, and says, Peace. Be still. And the Lord has a way of calming your troubled soul. I need that. Sometimes we get so restless. Sometimes we sometimes forget what we ought to be talking to God about in His riches. He said that you may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of this calling. What's your hope in? I quoted the other day by Brother Rudolph Outlaw. He was with us probably four or five times in revivals over the years. I've traveled with him. I've been in the same room with him. I've traveled overseas with him. I've been in revivals with him several times down at, uh, outside of Jacksonville. And he preached a sermon here that I'll never forget. And every time I saw him, I just reminded him of it. What is your world? What is your world? For if your world is the things of this life, when you lose them, you'll lose your world. If the pleasures of life are more important to you than the spiritual things of God, when you lose the pleasures of life, you'll lose your world. He says if some addiction is your world and you can't get along without it and you lose that, then you lose your world if that's the most important thing in your life. But he said when God and the Word of God is your real world, you need it every day of your life, you want to be refreshed from God, and there you have it down deep in the recesses of your soul, you can know that you know that you know that you know that God loves you, cares for you, and can give you hope when the world looks like it's about to sink in despair. And I think it's about there. It's a mess. Isn't the world a mess? Isn't the whole America economy in a mess? Isn't the whole economy, the whole political arena on abortion is a mess? To take little babies out of the womb, discuss it with the mom and dad, do you want to keep it or do not keep it? Now, folk, I've been around the block a while. I have trouble grasping that. And then to abort a little baby lying on the table beside them parents after they make a decision. And I heard it discussed this week, and I thought it was such a good, uh, I think it was the governor of Oklahoma who said, we're a conservative state. We believe in abortions wrong from conception. We just believe it needs to be outlawed completely. Amen. And he said, what I hear is parents say, well, I'm poor and I can't afford to have a child. How do you discern that? How many children can you have before you get rich? I mean, I'm so poor, I, I can't afford to have a child and it won't be able to have the things of life. In my daddy's family, there was 15 of them kids that was born into the family of James Ellis and Polly. And in my mother's family, there was 12 that was born into Riggs' family. And Charles Spurgeon Riggs was his name. And they had all those young'uns. I'm not telling you how many to have and how many not to have, but I don't think it's ever right to abort a child that's in the mother's womb that is alive. It is a sin and abomination to God, and we must continue to echo the truth and vote everybody out of office that believes that. You say, well, they're Democrats. Well, vote them out. The Republicans, vote them out. If they're independents, vote them out. Find out what they stand. One of the great litmus tests. You find out where they stand on some subjects. Somebody says they're going to vote for the lesser two evils. I just soon not vote and vote for a murderer. Yeah. Yeah. Taking a life that don't belong to them. 
blaspheming God to his very face. Thou shalt not kill is still a commandment and it carries over to all the Bible. And when you read the Bible, it will the reason why this world hates this book and they don't want to be around it is because it'll bring conviction to their soul. Get it away from me. Years ago in that office behind Warren and Rachel where I spent some time, I had a lady that was sitting across from the desk who was demon possessed. And I could tell she was demon possessed because I talked to her. And when I talked to her, another voice came out of her mouth. The one she was using. Something different about that. Now you can say, well, she just had schizophrenia. I think she had a demon in her. You say, well, how do you know? I said, let's, let's look what the Bible has to say. And when I bring the Bible close to her, she said, don't bring that book any farther. Don't you bring that book close to me. Why? It's just the Bible. It's just God's holy word. I tell you what it's about. It's all about Jesus. She said, I want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Why? For demonism does not want to hear the truth. They want to continue to keep you controlled under the power and the sway of their power to ruin, wreck, and destroy your life and to damn your soul in the eternal pit of hell. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants to deliver you and give you victory. Now give me the old book. Yeah. Give me the old book and stay with it until the day you die. You say, well, preacher, I just don't get excited like that. Well, Get excited. You don't have to be like all the rest of us, and all of us are different. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm just telling you to do it. Years ago, Miss Pat McManus was serving as secretary for me for a while, part time, and she gave me a, a, a round wooden button I carried for years. I don't have it now. And it says, Get to it. I like to bug me to death, Brian. Every time I pull that out, get to it. And I'm sure there's some things I need to get to, and so I had to get to it and get it done. I told her later in life, I just wish I'd have never got that. Bug me to death. Get to it. Get to it. Well, I'm just telling you whether you have a wooden coin or anything, I'm telling you from the Word of God, get to it. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Why? That you may know that you may be enlightened, that your hope may be increased. And this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My cares are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Heaven's waiting on me. The journey's going to be over. Thank God for the Bible that gives us a hope that the world didn't give us. And bless God, the world can't take it away. It's anchored in Jehovah God. And He's my God. He's your God. We're children of God. We're adopting the family. We are somebody tonight. Hey. We ought to be excited about it. But I've seen a law come around our church. I've seen a cloud in recent days. I say, Lord, is it me? Is it me? I want God to search my own heart. And David said, search me that you may know me. I want you to know Ephesians 1. And as you read the word of God, Lord, is it me? And if you say, is it me? It's sort of like the disciples when they were, were talking to Jesus. When he said, one of you shall betray me. And the disciples says, one of them said, is it me? Judas even said, is it me? Could it be you? Could it be me? I know God can bless in spite of some of us. But God wants to bless us. And sometimes there's sin in the camp. And sometimes there's things going on in people's lives that nobody's aware of except God and maybe the person. And then they try to see victory come and joy come, and it's not there, and it's almost like this vacuum that comes in their life. Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have separated you from God. It doesn't mean you're lost. It means your joy is gone. It means you've been robbed of that which God has given you and given me. I think it's time to, for us to have a good heart searching. I want you to do something for me, and I'll do it, promise you. I know Brother Terry wants to sign up on the wheel for prayer for the family revival, and he can say something about that when he gets time. But I want you to make a determination every day of your life. Just make a little vow unto God. Lord, every day, would you search me? Would you search me? Lord, please show me what I need to do. Lord, help me that I can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I be enlightened that I may know what is the hope of His calling and what these riches really are. I'm the richest man in town. If you don't believe it, look at my bank account. You say, well, preacher, I'm trying to get some of your guys, trying to get your social security number and your bank card numbers. We need to utilize them a little bit. So if you've got to around, just bring them to the church and we'll use them. But I'm talking about the bank of heaven, the bank I'm talking about. 
My God shall supply all your need. It doesn't say needs. I shall supply all of your needs. My God shall supply all your need. And the Bible says in Philippians 4.19, God shall supply all of your need according to His riches in Christ Jesus. You have a need. I have a need. I've got a need. I've got several needs. My wife and I have needs. The greatest need is to know you're in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I need you, Lord. I don't want to face tomorrow without you. I don't want to face what's coming to our children and grandchildren if time lasts without you. I'm a little afraid, and I want that to be conquered by the Lord's help. A good fear is not bad, but an unruly fear can be dangerous. I want to have a reverence for God, a fear for God, and an awesome for God, and respect for God and who He is. He is the God Almighty, but I don't want to be afraid. Somebody said, I'm not going to have any children because I don't want to bring them up in this world. Why did God tell us to procruciate? Why did He tell us to have children? Go into all the world and multiply. He told Noah, after the flood. It's not taken with and holding children. That's selfishness. They become like errors in the, uh, in the carrier you have on your back. And those errors to be shot like errors out in the world. They all may not be as good as we want them to be. But our children, grandchildren need to be errors that make an impact somewhere. And we're losing the battle. Loosen the battle. I talk to preachers every week of my life just about. Oh, you thank God for the bright spots. Thank God for the rejoicing times that come. Thank God for those who were baptized recently. And thank God for Myra's testimony about testimonies today that she was at. Thank God for that. And God's not out of the business of saving folk and baptizing them. You say, well, all churches are just going to go through a law. All churches don't have to go through a law. I believe the God of heaven wants to revive us as much as he wants to revive anybody else. And it's not God's fault. It's our fault uh, for not letting God search me, try me, see if any wicked way in me. Give me a rededication to being faithful to the Lord of glory, to the work of God, to the word of God and the way of God. Lord, don't let me be a hindrance in my own spiritual life. It keeps me down instead of up. Lord, would you search me? Every one of us ought to do that. If you're a Christian, you are in Christ Jesus. That's a pretty good place to be. Hide me there. Hide me. In the hand of God, in Jesus. Boy, that's a pretty good grip around you. And I'm glad he gave the down payment of the earnest of his spirit to guarantee us that we'll go to heaven. That's the earnest of the spirit. You're going to go. But I don't know when I'm going to go. I just know I'm going to go. I've already had the promise from God. His word says that he's given the earnest of his spirit. He's already given the down payment. He showed us his riches. He's making a payment for us on the mansion of glory. Are you going to have a mansion of glory? And all of God's people said amen. You know why he said amen? Because the Bible says so. I don't know all that's going to happen. I said last week or two weeks ago how it's going to be and how everything's going to filter out. Boy, I feel like preaching tonight. I just, I got to, my wife said, won't you quit saying you're going to preach a brief sermon? Duh. Maybe that's my problem, I reckon. Maybe sometimes I want to get the message out quicker than God does. And I'm not saying having longevity just to have a longevity sake. You see, most people don't go to church three times a day. They don't go hours sometimes running buses and getting home late at night. Not every church folks does that. But there are some that do. And there are some that while we're getting ready to eat lunch, they still out on a bus route somewhere laboring is it easy it's never easy to do any kind of laboring for the lord it's always work he says work till jesus comes occupy till jesus comes if you're a christian you're in christ jesus paul gives some pictures of a christian and i believe this with you and i'll quote and we'll get down to praying here in just a moment because i think it's a priority that god wants me to stress tonight the pattern for a healthy church he gets two marks one is faith in jesus christ and number two is love for all Christians. I want to say that again. I'll amplify it on next week, the Lord willing. Mark number one, in a healthy Christian. I want to be a healthy Christian. I don't want to be an anemic in my spiritual life. I don't want to be one that's sickly in my Christian life. My body may get sick and it may ache in pain, but on the inside I want to have a renewing of God's power in my life. 
The object of your faith is Jesus Christ, nothing else and nothing more. Let's amplify that next week. Number two, let's make the observation from the Scriptures. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yes or no? Amen. Are you saved? Are you in the family? Have you been born again? Have you been birthed in the family? Have you been adopted? And the name is pinned in the eternal warrows of God's heaven that we're going to go there when this life is over. Mark number two, love for all Christians. Let's read verse 15 and I'm through. Wherefore I also, after heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. We're in the same family. We don't always agree. We don't always see eye to eye. We're on different levels of maturity. Some are far more mature than I am. Some may just have begun the journey as a little baby. We're all on a journey. Sometimes you've got to be a little more patient with others because they're not where you're at, but you think they need to be where you're at. Sometimes we try to rush folks as soon as they get saved. They've got to quit all their bad habits. It don't work that way. God has a way of working on a person's heart. If they'll let the Holy Ghost of God enlighten them and show them, you'll be amazed what God can do if you'll let Him. And He'll speak to you about things the preacher never mentions. Things you ought to give up and quit. Start doing. Quit, start doing and stop doing. Start doing and stop some things. Mark 2, love for all Christians. And the Bible says if you don't love the brethren, you're not saved. That's about as plain as I can put it. You know that you pass from death unto life if you love the brethren. Amen. Now, if anybody in this church you don't love, you've got a problem. And i got a problem. If anybody in this church that you don't love and you feel almost hatred toward them, you've got a problem, a serious problem. And it needs to be dealt with. He says, I want you to love all of the brethren and sisters. And there's five, four or five things I want to give under that point next week, the Lord willing. I hope you'll be here. Not next week. I can't preach next week. Johnny Pike's preaching. I may just shove him out of the way and preach in here. <laughs> but he's supposed to preach next week. But I want you to study the Ephesians 1. See who you are in Christ. Let's see what God can do for us. Amen. Amen. Don't you want to see the church revived? Amen. Get involved more in soul warning and talking to Jesus, about Jesus to people not being ashamed of him, come with the joy in your heart. And, oh, when's the preacher going to hush? <laughs> We've been here an hour. Well, not quite an hour yet, 55 minutes, and he's worn me out. <laughs> and i got a television program I need to see before I go to bed. I hope your television blows up. <laughs> if you've got a television program you need to see before I get through preaching, when the invitation is given, you ought to run to the altar. Amen. You say, but it's a good movie. There ain't no good movie greater than Jesus Christ and the riches of glory. None, none whatsoever. We ought to take our televisions probably and throw them out the back door anyhow. I'm not advocating you have to do that, but I'm telling you what, they sap a lot of time. And then we can go right down the computer list and all the things that we talk about. I'm not here to be on a negative kick tonight. I just want us to love everybody. So we'll start this way. I've done this many times. I love you. I love you. And let's all say it together. You look at me and say, Preacher, I love you. Preacher, now, if you don't love me, don't lie. <laughs> get out the door and start talking about the preacher for you before you get home, before the biscuits get warm. You've already butchered the preacher one time at the supper table. Just tell me you love me and mean it. Now, that goes for me going towards you. Let me say it now. I love you, except for a few. <laughs> Who drive me up a wall, you know what I mean? But thank you. Loving people, and I close with this thought, and I don't want to make it an insult, but it's true of us as sheep of the pastor. If you're going to learn to pastor a church, you've got to learn to get dirty. That means you've got to be down where they live in dirt and filth. And sometimes it's sickening to you because you've been around a long time. It doesn't mean you water with them in the mud, but you get down where they're at and say, here's a hand. And they reach up that muddy hand of addiction and take your hand and say, I need help. No matter what they look like, what they smell like, how bad they are, what road they've been down, there ought to be a loving hand from a loving Christian who says, I love you. Let's don't get beyond that. If we're going to be a loving church, and Miss Jenny, appreciate the note today. 
who said your church is so loving. Thank you, my wife. She don't she have a wonderful smile talking about you, Miss Janie? Every time she saw you, she said, she has a smile, as others do. She said, the church loves people. I want it to be that way. Amen. It's not going to happen accidentally. Let's do it. I'm going to close my second time. <laughs> when you come to church, get out of your shell and get out of your rut and get out of your routine. Amen. It is not about you sitting on a pew. I'm going to write a poem one day. It's not about you sitting on a pew. I mean, if there's somebody coming to this church you don't know, make a beeline to them. Introduce yourself. And let them know you care. Let them know you love them. You know, offer to be an assistant. We can help you. Show them a bulletin. Give them an announcement. Tell them something. Just tell them you love them. Glad you're here. God bless. You can tell people you love them and mean it because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts. Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.